and not your morals. And when you come to God, be a small child and not a big camel. It's not often you get called a camel in church, but I'm going to call you on potentially today. Don't be one. Come to God as a small child. Verse 15. They were bringing even infants to Jesus that he might touch them. Infants, it's a word for those still in the womb or those ready size. And they were being brought to Jesus. Well, obviously not in the womb because you can't do that. But these ones are being brought to Jesus that he might touch them. What's all that about? Well, to pray for them and to bless them. It was tradition that when a child reached one year of age, you'd take them to the rabbi and they would pray for them and bless them. And so mums, wanting the best for their children, would bring them to this this, uh, authoritative, uh, loving, gracious, powerful rabbi to pray for them. But when the disciples saw it, They rebuked them. But Jesus called them to him, saying, let the children come to me and do not hinder them. For to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. I just want to go away from my notes a little bit, but sometimes we forbid those coming to Jesus, who Jesus wants to come to him. Sometimes we act on his behalf, but it's not actually what he wants. And if you have been hurt by Christians, which I'm sure you have at some point, then I suppose as a pastor, I apologize on behalf of the church, but I say don't let that put you off Jesus, because sometimes his followers get it wrong. They, they were saying, keep your toddlers. Don't want their snotty noses and pooey nappies around Jesus. He's too busy. Can't you see he's on the way to Jerusalem? Take him away. Were they acting the way that Jesus wanted? No, they weren't. They misrepresented him at that point. But when we come to God, we are to come not childishly, not throwing tantrums, you know, not stuffing your face full of chocolate instead of having your greens, but to come like a child. Trusting, yeah. So um, it amazes me that I can pass Reggie around pretty much to anyone, and within a few seconds, if they do the right, ah, or noises, he'll love them. And his face will light up, particularly if you hold it above your head or sing a silly song. Children trust, don't they? Sadly, that changes over time as they learn not to trust certain people. But children, you know, as as little as just trust. And that's a beautiful quality. And as we come to God, let us be in that way. Other people might have upset me, Lord, but Dad, I trust you. You Pick me up, throw me up in the air if you want to, because I know you'll catch me. To such belongs the kingdom of God. Whoever doesn't receive the kingdom of God like a child won't enter it. Maybe you're sitting around and you're trying to figure out everything about God and put him into a box. Well, if that's the way you're coming to God, you're not going to come at all. There are some things you just have to accept by faith. What else are those qualities of children that Jesus was talking about? Well, children grieve over wrongdoing. I think as you grow up, you learn to, oh, well, make an excuse for that. But littlies, you know, if they've taken a a chocolate bar and you pull them up on it because they shouldn't have, they'll cry. (laughs) Children grieve over wrongdoing. As we come to God, have have a soft heart, grieve over wrongdoing. And children similar to what we've just talked about, don't feel a need to prove themselves. In the middle of the night, Reggie doesn't get down on his hands and knees or say, Mommy, remember yesterday when I slept and let you have your dinner? Can I have some milk, please? He doesn't do any of that. He gives a little cry, and then Mum provides for him. He doesn't feel the need to prove himself. 
It would be very strange if he did. In fact, we wouldn't want him to feel that he has to prove himself. He's our son. If you're a child of God, God doesn't want you to have to feel you need to prove yourself to come to him. We relate to him on the basis of his grace. And Jesus very famously said in John chapter 3 and verse 3, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Come to him as a child, simply trust him. So be a small child and don't be a big camel. A ruler asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, this chap was a ruler. This might have meant that he was part of the Sanhedrin, the religious ruling council of Israel. Um, We read later on in the story that he's rich. And the other Gospels say that he's young. He's got everything going for him. He's rich, he's young, he's famous, he's powerful. Kind of like me. Um, And he comes to Jesus. And I don't know whether he's trying to flatter, or whether he does really want to know. It's it's hard to tell. But he says, good teacher. This was unique. As Jesus pulls him up on, because he says, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. In other words, either don't call me good, because only God is good, or call me God if I am good. And the answer is, Jesus is God, isn't it? But he says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And I have asked this question before, but what must you do to inherit? Open floor. Yeah, think, think, think just, you know, a rich, a rich old aunt. Yeah. Right. Kath said, wait for somebody to die. And it's a blunt way, but she's right. You know, think, think in the natural. How do you inherit an estate from, from a rich old aunt or, or, or maybe a parent? Well, what must I do? Nothing, really. It's based on another person's actions, isn't it? For me to inherit from somebody else, that person has to act. That person has to save, you know, buy a house, uh, put some savings away. That person has to act to create an estate, if you like, don't they? That person has to act um, to write a will. They have to go to the trouble of writing a will and writing you in it. And that person has to die for you to inherit. All you need to do is basically accept that by signing a paper. So when he comes to Jesus and he says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Do you want to have eternal life? Uh, Yes, I'm sure you do. Well, you don't need to do anything because all the doing has been done by Jesus. But Jesus sort of plays along with this. and, And Jesus says, you know the commandments. Do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. Trivia. Is this on the first or the second table of the commandments? It's on the second. These are all to do with relating to people. The first ones, you know, you shall not have any other gods before me, etc. So Jesus pulls the man up on five of the six commandments on that second table. And the man says, all these I have kept from my youth. When Jesus brought the Ten Commandments to this man in answer to the question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Was Jesus saying that if you keep all the commandments, then you'll be saved? I don't think he was. Because The man answers, well, I've kept these from the youth. But when Jesus heard this, he said to him, one thing you still lack, sell all that you have, 
and distribute it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. But when he heard these things, he became very sad, for he was extremely rich. Galatians 3.24 says that the law is our guardian until that time, till Christ arrives. So in the days that the New Testament was written, um, before you could kind of become a fully-fledged adult, you were kept under a guardian, particularly if, you know, um, you were, you were, your parents had died and the estate had been left to you. You weren't deemed responsible until, until 18, so you were given a guardian. You weren't always to stay with that guardian. They were preparing you for that time when, you know, maturity would come. God gave the law as a guardian for us. It was never meant to save people. It was meant to prepare them for Jesus. You know the pictures, don't you? It's like a mirror. And when you hold up that mirror to yourself or to myself, it shows me my own heart. And it shows me where I've broken it through and through. And so Jesus um, directs this man to the tenth commandment, which is you shall not covet, when he says, okay, well, sell everything you've got then. And the man then is unwilling to do that. And so his heart is shown. He'd been revealed that there was sin in his life even though he'd lived that moral life. And if he wanted eternal life, well, he'd have to follow Jesus. But he was unwilling to let go, wasn't he? He heard these things and he became very sad, for he was extremely rich. And then the other Gospels tell us that he went away from Jesus. This might be the only person in all the New Testament who left Jesus in a worse state than he did when he came. Because he was unwilling to respond. Jesus said, when the man had left, how difficult it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. For it is easier for a camel, there you go, to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And those who heard it said, then who can be saved? But Jesus said, what is impossible with man is possible with God. This rich young ruler was unwilling to let go of his stuff, wasn't he? Now, some people talk about a door in the gate in the city of Jerusalem, excuse me, a gate to the city. And within that gate, there was a very small door, apparently, that was called the the eye of a needle. And so if you wanted to bring your stuff or your camel with all your goods in, you'd have to throw all the goods off the camel, make him squat down and bring him through like this. That door may have existed. And just assume that it is for a moment. You've got to be willing to let go. The things, the obstacles, the covetousness, the desire for stuff, And making that an idol in your life. Let me ask you the question. When you wake up, what is it that your thoughts often go to? When you have free time, where do your thoughts go to? Do they go to stuff and holidays and cars and whatever? (laughs) They often do. These can become idols in our lives. We're to let go. That camel, if he wanted to go through a little gate, had to get rid of all of his baggage, didn't he? But to be honest... When Jesus talks about a camel going through the eye of a needle, I think he's actually talking about a camel and he's actually talking about an eye of a needle. Because if it was about this gate, Jesus effectively says, you can save yourself. Because he goes on to say that what is impossible with man is possible with God. You can't put a camel through a needle's eye. You can put a needle through the eye of a camel, but that's another matter. But you can't put a camel through the eye of a needle. It's impossible. Is Jesus saying that wealth is bad? That it's wrong to have possessions? Some people have thought that. 
And there are some Christians who have sold everything they have, and I think more power to them. If you could live that way, not having that baggage, then that is wonderful. And the Lord might even call you to do that. We, we need not write that out. But having possessions in themselves is not bad. Abraham, David, Solomon were incredibly rich men. But they were righteous, you know. Having possessions isn't the problem. But when your possessions have you, that's the problem. Maybe you've got some really treasured thing. Um, I don't think anyone has got a particularly snazzy car. But maybe it is your car or um, it's a reputation or a qualification or, or something like that. Is it possessing you? If so, for the sake of your soul, you need to let it go. And there's a reward for letting go. Because Peter says, Jesus, we've left our homes and we've followed you. And he said to them, truly I say to you, there's no one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God who will not receive many times more in this life and in the age to come, eternal life. Are you going to follow Jesus? You're going to need to leave some things behind. You don't take anything with you. And no. There's no tow bar in a hearse, is there? No. You can't take anything with you. So, <laughs> carry on as, 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 as you mean to go, as you mean to carry on. But those things which you do leave behind as you follow Jesus, which he puts on your heart and he says, Kath, this has got to go. Ralph, you need to leave this if you're going to follow me. There's nothing that you leave that you will not be thankful you have in eternity and that you will not be rewarded for in this life. Now, are you going to say if you're a married man and you've left your wife, and I don't, the Lord would never tell you to do that, but in, hypothetically he did, he's not going to reward you with lots of wives, so you shouldn't expect that what you leave behind will be rewarded the same but multiplied. He may give you contentment where you are filled with covetousness. He may give you joy where the burden of looking after all this stuff was really getting you down. He might give you victory over sin in an area of your life when you've given up this thing. And if he does, it's all about his grace. If you leave that behind, you will not regret it. So when you come to God, trust his mercy and not your morals. Don't go and try to impress him about what you've done or not done, but say, Lord, be merciful to me. And when you come to God, be like a small child. Trust. Have a soft heart. Don't feel that you need to prove yourself to your father rather than a big camel carrying all this stuff, all your possessions which are actually possessing you and come to Jesus. Jesus is the door. And he's a door that stands open. But you can't go carrying all your stuff through. What we're going to do is have a time of prayer and prayer of confession. We don't formally do this often, but I'd like us to do this morning. We'll do it quietly. And on the screen is going to be Luke 18 and verse 14. So we'll take some time quietly to do so. And then after a few minutes together, we're going to read out loud Psalm 32. But this is a time to confess to the Lord and to ask him to search your heart as well. Maybe meditating on that verse on the screen. <laughs> 